He was elected Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire in 2003, having served as Canon to the Ordinary, and in lay terms that means Assistant to the Bishop. <laughs> so he had a lot of on-the-job training, actually. Yeah, for nearly exactly. years. He was consecrated Bishop in November of 2003 and was invested as the ninth Bishop of New Hampshire in March of 2004. Gene's story is featured in the 2007 feature-length documentary Before the Bible Tells Me So, which many of you have seen. How many have seen? Oh my lord. <laughs> and his book, In the Eye of the Storm, Swept to the Center by God, was released in 2008. Bishop Robinson was invited by President Barack Obama to give the invocation as he was becoming president at the opening inaugural ceremonies at the Lincoln Memorial in January of 2009. And then, well, he's becoming president again. Anyway, <laughs> then in 2012, Gene authored God Believes in Love, Straight Talk About Gay Marriage. And that was, a, and also a feature length documentary on Bishop Robinson's, Robinson's ministry called Love Free or Die, which premiered at the Sundance Film Festival that same year. Bishop Robinson graduated from the University of, of the, the South with a BA in American Studies and History, and he completed his Master of Divinity degree at the General Theological Seminary in New York, and was ordained deacon and then priest, serving as a curate at Christ Church in Ridgewood, New Jersey. Jean is the co-author of three AIDS education curricula for youth and adults, and has done AIDS work in the United States and Africa, specifically in Uganda and South Africa. He has also been an advocate for anti-racism training in the diocese and wider church. He holds two honorary doctorates and has received numerous awards from national civil rights organizations. Bishop Robinson has been particularly active in the area of full civil rights for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people. And working at the state, national, and international levels, he has spoken and lobbied for equal protection under the law and full civil marriage rights. He has been honored by many LGBT organizations for this work, including the Human Rights Campaign, Lambda Legal, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, GLAD, and the Equality Forum. On a personal level, Jean enjoys entertaining and cooking, gardening, music, and theater. He is the father of two grown daughters and the proud grandfather of two granddaughters. And on a personal level, uh, you know that Jean uh, served as a chaplain in residence for us here. He's been a uh, speaker for the two o'clock lecture. He came here to be part of us, not as a stranger. Right. And I must say, on a personal level, I am most pleased to welcome Jean to this uh, gathering of welcome tonight here at Chautauqua. I am personally so grateful to be working with Gene and to now present you to all of him here tonight. So we will now let Greg welcome Gene and let Greg do his interviewing magic as he always <laughs> does. does. <laughs> Let's welcome Gene and Greg. <laughs> Thank you. So what would you change on what Maureen just said? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there was something she said that I wanted to tell a story about, and and now I can't remember uh, what it was about. Um, I will say that uh, we only do girls in my family, apparently. There are no boys in sight. There's, um, I have my two granddaughters, they're 14 and 12, live in Vermont, and my, uh, with my older daughter and her wife. That's a kind of a funny story. So my, my older daughter uh, met and married a guy in college, and he mm, became somewhat borderline um, abusive um, And uh, after having these two daughters. And sh she ended that, which was a, a really good thing. And about, I don't know, four or five years ago, she uh, called up one night, and I said, wow, you sound in a good humor. And she says, Daddy, I'm in love again. And I'm like, oh, sweetheart, that's the best. She says, with a woman. I said, get out. <laughs> and she's like, I know, isn't it the weirdest thing? She said, never thought about it, never fantasized about it, never agonized over it. She's like, boom, there it was. And they got married a year ago, September. 
They're happy as a clam. My younger daughter lives in New York City, is in the film business, the publicity end of things, and at the moment, she is running the Academy Awards campaign for the film Lady Bird, which is a great movie. If you haven't seen it, go. So that even with all that, I can't remember what I was going to tell the story about. But it'll 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 happen. That's okay. Welcome to our world here. This is good. So you were the bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of New Hampshire. The only question I really have, were you a Yankees fan or a Red Sox fan? <laughs> oh, so definitely a Red Sox fan. You, you can't be north of Boston and not be a Red Sox fan. It's just, it's not allowed. It's just not allowed. Um, uh, I, I actually grew up in Kentucky and I had this uh, very strange sort of spiritual experience, which is um, I didn't get to New England until I was taking a year off from seminary to be the chaplain at the University of Vermont. And w the first time I drove to Vermont, it was like coming home. I, I mean, I'd never lived anywhere like that, that looked like that. It, it was just this very weird thing that happened inside me like, I belong here. I do not belong in Kentucky, I belong right here. And uh, so I fell in love with it and ultimately moved back there. Talk about Kentucky. What was that like? What was your upbringing? So um, uh, I consider it a, a, a source of pride that I didn't live in a house with running water until I was 10. Um, my parents were tobacco sharecroppers, about as close to slavery as white people have come in this country. Uh, they were completely at the mercy of the landowners and so on. They did all the work and the, the landowner took um, half or more of, of the profits. Um, uh, so, uh, so we were really, really poor. Uh, the rule was when you go to the outhouse, you have to bring a, a bucket of coal back in with you because that's, that was our heat. And if we wanted water, we cranked it out of a cistern. You wanted hot water, you put it in a pan and you put it on the stove. Um, so I, and my, when I was growing up, my mother used to put a big uh, wash tub of water on the uh, top of the cistern. And <coughs> by noon, it was warm from the sun, and I would take a bath in there and then go to um, uh, vacation Bible school in the afternoon. Um, I grew up really, re very religious um, in a Disciples of Christ uh, congregation, uh, rural, small, um, and I don't think there was anyone in the congregation that didn't raise tobacco. I mean, I, it, it was just all tobacco farmers. and. Um, uh, so I was baptized in a creek uh, near the church there. With, uh, they chased the water moccasins away for a short time and <laughs> took me in the water and uh, uh, down you went. Um, the, the interesting thing about the disciples um, is that um, they have communion every Sunday. So that was something that I, uh, that I saw continued in the Episcopal Church that, that made me feel so comfortable. Um, but I'd never been in an Episcopal Church until I went to college. Uh, my parents being poor, um, uh, we could not afford uh, any kind of college at any level. Uh, but uh, I got a full scholarship to the University of the South, um, or Sewanee is the name of the town it's in, and that's what most people know it by. And um, uh, so went there on a, on a full scholarship, and because it's owned by the 20 plus southern dioceses of the Episcopal Church, I walked into an Episcopal Church for the first time. And again, it was not unlike coming to New England. I sort of felt like I had come home. I loved the Disciples Church, although I must say I was, by the time I went to college, I was fighting with my church. Um, nobody could tell me um, how a loving God would condemn to hell all those people who had never even heard of Jesus, never mind accepted him as their uh, personal Lord and Savior. So, uh, and, and the thing that really infuriated me was um, they said to me, you know, there are some questions you just shouldn't ask. Well, I was, uh, first of all, I was 17, so I knew everything there was to know anyway. But I was, uh, uh, I knew that there were questions for which there were not 
answers, or at least easy answers, but I didn't think there was any question that, that shouldn't be asked. And very soon after that, I arrive at Sewanee. I am spouting off about how bad religion is and the church and so on and so forth, and a young uh, assistant chaplain at, at, uh, at the University of the South um, said, well, um, I, and I said, uh, I had all these questions, and everybody's like, well, I don't know if, if, if we have the answers, but why don't you come on in and let's, let's try to find them together. And I thought, well, that's, that's pretty undefensive and kind of inviting. And so I did, and then um, I would complain about the uh, Nicene Creed, and he would say, I would say, there's just parts of it. I just, you know, I don't, I don't buy it. And, uh, and he would say, well, why don't you just drop out of, of those parts? Don't, you know, don't say something you don't believe. But, uh, so just drop out of, from those phrases and say the parts you can. And I thought, well, that's pretty not, un, you know, not defensive on his part. And I think I can do that. And pretty soon I found myself saying more and, and so on. And um, so I finally drank the Kool-Aid about um, uh, my senior year was confirmed on Easter day of my senior year in college and uh, went off to seminary. I was so dumb about the Episcopal Church, um, I had made plans <laughs> to go to New York to the seminary and someone said, um, and what did your bishop think about that? And I'm like, bishop? <laughs> Am I supposed to talk to a bishop before I go to seminary? Oh yes, I was supposed to talk to a bishop. <laughs> so I went back to uh, Kentucky. I'd never gone to an Episcopal church in Kentucky and found a church in Lexington and um, who took me on and um, so I went to seminary. So here you are, you're going to college, you get 17, you're a rebel, feeling with a cause. What does mom and dad think about what's going on in your head? Um, so um, they were very disappointed uh, that I would leave the Disciples of Christ Church. Um, my like five generations back great-grandfather um, helped found that little congregation. So the Disciples of Christ sort of began um, uh, around Cane Ridge and, and so we were one of the very first Disciples parishes um, uh, mid mid nineteenth century, and um, came out of one of the Great Awakenings, and uh, so I it wasn't like I was just uh, saying no to a particular denomination. I was saying no to this this family experience, and back in those days, you know, like um, uh, full blown misogyny, um, it, it didn't matter how many daughters you had; it, ha it mattered how many sons you had, and it happens happened to be that there was only one son in each generation connecting me back to the, that great-grandfather um, that founded this parish. So that one son had, you know, been a deacon and then an elder in the Disciples' Church. So I was walking away from all of that. It wasn't, it wasn't just about religion, it was about family. And um, the Moonies were big at that time. And, um, and I reminded them that I could be doing something a lot more exotic <laughs> and dangerous than the Episcopal Church, for God's sake. Um, uh, and what they thought, and what I, what I used to think was, it's like Catholic. And that was not a good thing, right? Because we thought there were Jews and Christians and Catholics. <laughs> we really did. Um, that, that part of the world is very anti-Catholic. Um, all the Catholics in Kentucky live in three counties, and that's where the bourbon comes from. <laughs> I'm just saying. So along that bourbon trail, what is your favorite? <laughs> well, let's see. So I stopped drinking 12 years ago. Um, um, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and uh, thanks be to God, um, one of the um, greatest things that ever happened to me was, was getting sober. I celebrated 12 years um, uh, about one week ago. It was very poignant for me because this young man who had committed suicide did so in a uh, drunken stupor and uh, had threatened his girlfriend with a, with a uh, gun and she had called the police and he blew his head off before they got there. And um, so at the funeral I talked about that. I said, like, I know, I know about this dark hole you can be in, right? And I know how hopeless it can feel. And um, 
you know, he was battling demons that just overtook him. But mostly it was because he couldn't ask for help, you know. And those of us who have gotten sober have, uh, have been enabled, enabled to do that by a lot of caring people who've been through that before us and, uh, and helped us out. So, so um, uh, it's been so long since I've drunk, I can't even remember. If, I'm sure it was a Kentucky bourbon, though. <laughs> Maker's Mark, that was it, that was it. So, again, along your career path here, you are, we got you to K Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Was it Lexington? Lexington. Lexington. And now where? So then went off to seminary to New York City. I mean, I was one of those kids who would um, go to the library and either just read or sometimes, I, uh, confession is good for the soul, steal the, the theater section from the New York Times and take it home and scour through it. And um, uh, I always dreamt to be in New York. And so, of course, I went to the Episcopal Seminary in New York, which happens to be the oldest uh, seminary in New York. You'll, um, it, it's kind of an interesting thing for those of you who know Manhattan. So it's in Chelsea, right? And when the Episcopal Church was given a piece of land by uh, Clement Clark Moore, who wrote uh, Twas the Night Before Christmas, he was a bishop. Uh, in the Episcopal Church, he gave the land for this new seminary, and the church was criticized for taking it because it was so far out in the country <laughs> that, that people said it would never have any relevance. Now it's at about 20th Street and 9th Avenue <laughs> in Manhattan, but at that time, of course, town was down down at Wall Street. So, uh, so I'm there in um, uh, New York. Um, I cared a whole lot more about my uh, theater tickets and uh, my dance tickets. Um, I loved the Joffrey Ballet and the New York City Ballet and uh, Alvin Ailey had just started. Um, so, and then, and then if I had any money left over, I paid for tuition. <laughs> um, I, um, uh, seminary was a great experience and at that time it, it was quite fashionable for seminarians to take a year off to, to do something, usually some kind of chaplaincy. And that's when I uh, went to be the chaplain at uh, the University of Vermont. It was a great experience to, to uh, uh, discover where the holes were in your education while you still had another year to like make up for them, right? Uh, and I found that to be very helpful. It, uh, I, I wish it were uh, still possible and, and uh, popular to do that because I think it was it was great training. What was the hole in your education? Um, well, so the, here's the thing about seminary is that you know you might preach twice a semester, maybe sometimes once, and you'd have weeks to you know get ready for it. Well, I mean, preaching every Sunday was like. What a shock, like, is, is it Sunday again already? <laughs> uh, so that was, that was one thing. Um, uh, and and I, I guess probably I learned that um, overthinking it um, uh, probably doesn't make it any, uh, any better, right? And um, I don't know where I learned along the way. Um, I, I sort of believe in plain talk. Um, I don't like people who have what I call a stained glass voice. You know how their voice changes when they're leading a service? I hate that. And I mean, I want people to recognize that it's me, right? And that I'm bringing me to this thing. And, um, and I also think, it was interesting. So at, the, at this uh, funeral, this past weekend, um, um, we got through most of the service and through all the eulogies except for what I was gonna say without suicide having ever been mentioned. And I thought, this is crazy. This is just crazy. Everybody here knows it. And I, so I said that. I said, so here's what. Brooks killed himself and we all know that. And, and, uh, and y all of you are gonna need to talk about that. If you knew him well enough to be here, then at some point we're gonna need to talk about this and, and we might as well start today, really. And, um, and, and kind of where I went with that sermon was like, you know, you're left wondering, can anything positive come out of such an experience? And what I said was, 
you know, he was struggling with demons and they overcame him. Some of you are struggling with demons, alcohol or whatever, you know, and and if you're like Brooks and are, haven't been able to reach out for help, maybe maybe this would be a good time for you to consider that. Or maybe there's somebody in your family who's struggling with demons and maybe you need to reach out to them the way you know, people uh, uh, want to respect your privacy and so they don't want to, you know, confront you or whatever. But I said, you know, unhelped and unconfronted, this is how it ends, right? So, so the number of people afterwards who just thanked me for that, they had had experiences of going through entire funerals where, where that elephant in the room was never named and how weird it made them feel. And, and, and so I, I, so f from very early on, I, I think I wanted to speak uh, plainly and honestly. Did that come through being at the University of Vermont, this sort of year period where you, did you have unhelped and unconfronted demons that you were kind of hoping to resolve that at that time? Um, yeah, uh, so um, I had, I figured out probably when I was 12 or 13 that I was different. Now remember, we didn't have the word gay then. Um, and, and if homosexuality was spoken about at all, it was in whispers and, um, and obviously uh, surrounded by shame and guilt and um, judgment and all of that sort of stuff. Um, I remember um, uh, 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 a friend, uh, one of the, the bunch of us that all ran around together, had gotten hold of a Playboy magazine which, by the way, is, you can see, I mean, what, what was in Playboy back in those days, you can see on TV any, any time <laughs> here, you know. It was, Fantastic it, literature. It was so, that. I, I got it just for the interviews. Yeah, yeah right. Um, but I knew, I could tell by what they were saying that these pictures were doing things for them that, that it wasn't doing for me. And at the very same moment, I, I knew that if I said that, I would, I would be in trouble, maybe even physically in danger, right? And that's what happens or used to happen for uh, gay and lesbian kids who, who at some point started living two lives. There's, you know, the, the, the one that's you that you can't show the world and then the one that you do live and, and, and do show the world and, um, and that's the kind of uh, difficult uh, thing that um, that all uh, certainly uh, of, of my age uh, went through. And so um, I got into therapy to change myself. Lord knows I tried prayer that, you know, if, if praying could have changed it, that, it, that would have happened. Um, got in therapy for two years. And, and so when I met um, the woman who became my wife, I, I explained to her that my Really, my relationships had been with men, but I'd been in therapy, and um, and I thought I was ready for a relationship with a woman, and I got uh, got really frightened about that about a month and a half before the the, uh, the wedding itself, and I broke down one night in crying and and said, I, I'm just afraid this will rear its ugly head someday, and and she said, I think um, if that happens, we love each other enough that we can. Um, uh, we'll handle it together. And so 13 years later we did, and we did a thing that I'm, um, I, I, um, I look back on it and I, I sort of can't even believe that we did it. We actually went to church to end our marriage. We, um, there was a priest in um, uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, which is where the judge was that uh, oversaw our divorce. So we went to the judge's chambers for the final divorce decree and then went back with the priest to his church. And in the context of the Eucharist, the communion service, you know, we asked each other's forgiveness and for any ways we had hurt each other. We uh, pledged ourselves to the joint raising of our children. Um, you know, we thanked each other and um, uh, and then had communion. It was just one of the most um, healing moments ever. Um, and I, I, um, I think I had heard about it. I think the UCC church might have been, had a service or something like that. I, I never saw the service, but I, I heard about it and I thought, you know, 
you stand up in front of God and everybody to get married. Uh, I didn't want to go like slinking out of it, you know, like without like checking back in with the with the God that had blessed it. So it was a, a really uh, really important thing. So so if there was a demon, it was that. Um, um, uh, you know, I, I came to see it not as a demon, but a gift. But for a long time, it felt like a demon. And, uh, and I guess I would say, um, just as I felt called uh, uh, to ordination by God, I also felt called out of the closet by God. Because how do you get up in front of a bunch of people on a Sunday and call them to a life of integrity and then not lead one yourself, right? And so, um, uh, I, I really, really felt um, called by God to do that. And the, and the book that unlocked it for me was a book by um, John Fortunato. It was called uh, Embracing the Exile. And um, um, it, I, I've never had God speak through, I suppose God has spoken through the Bible to me. But... Um, no book like that sounded like God's voice, like like His His book. So that um, and that convinced me that I needed needed to do something. You spoke about needing to do something. At some point, you obviously have this uh, co uh, coming out. You public with your wife. The unmarried, I don't know if that's the term, yeah. but you had to kind of take a trip down to your parents oh. and explain that. Yeah, it was the longest trip I ever made uh, to drive to Kentucky to tell my parents, oh, by the way, I'm getting divorced. Oh, yeah, and the reason is I'm gay. Not a great message, you know, in 1986 that two parents in um, uh, Kentucky want to hear. So it was really hard. I was not sure uh, m that my father was going to let me stay in the house that night. Uh, if it hadn't been for my mother, I think he, he would have thrown me out. Um, as, as so many kids get thrown I mean, even today, 40% of all the kids on the streets of America are LGBT kids who have been thrown out by their parents. 40%. And I'll tell you, we are not 40% of the population, right? Anyway. Um, I mean, to their credit, gosh, I love them. So here's what I tell people who are, who are about to come out um, to their parents or to their brothers and sisters or whatever else. I say, how long did it take you to come out to yourself? Like to admit to yourself that you're gay. Uh, how long a process was that? Oh, well, oh my gosh, or 10 years or 12 years or since I was born or whatever. And I say to them, so remember when you tell your parents, this is day number one for them. If it took you 10 years to come to this, uh, to accept it in yourself, for God's sake, you can't expect them to accept it in 20 minutes just because you've said it, right? So um, to their credit, you know, um, um, one of the things that I, I believe with my whole heart is that at, at the end of the day, love wins, right? If not today, then maybe tomorrow, but love wins. And um, they loved me enough to just hang in there with me, right? Even when they just didn't understand it. So here's one of the funny things. So, so parents have to come out too, right? Or, or th they have to live in a closet, which is what my parents did because, th you know, they're in Kentucky. It's not real liberal down there. And, um, and they were afraid that they would get tarred with the same brush that, that I would be, right? So they didn't tell anybody. Imagine their surprise when I became bishop and my uh, picture was on the front page of every newspaper around the world, <laughs> including the Lexington Herald Leader. <laughs> and now all of a sudden, they're, all their friends, you know, I mean, their friends were not stupid, okay. But anyway, uh, it's, on, it's in the paper, and how shocked were they when people started calling up to congratulate them. <laughs> you, mean, you must be so proud. And they were like, 
really? <laughs> uh, I mean, it was a real shock for them. And it's another reminder that, you know, uh, this is a family thing, right? And, and sometimes uh, parents have to come out, too. Um, uh, they, because many of them are just as closeted about their LGBT children. I mean, as you know, uh, those times are changing, but in 1986, that was, that, was, that was tough. My parents lived long, I mean, my dad is still alive. He's 92, healthy as a horse, drives better than I do. He, he is amazing. So he's still alive. My mom only died five years ago at 87 or whatever. They lived long enough to not only make their peace with it, but to celebrate it. They fell in love with my partner. Uh, they, you know, uh, um, they didn't say the word gay for years, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we, we, had our, we had our trials and tribulations, but they hung in there and I hung in there. And um, um, it, was, it, it was really a lovely thing. They even, <laughs> they even did a photo shoot with me because w we were on the front page of a special, so um, like the second week in October is coming out week, right? Most n gay groups celebrate that and encourage people to come out if they haven't and support them and so on and so forth. So the, the big newspaper in Dallas, Texas, which by the way is one of the gayest cities in America, huge gay community, they do a special supplement in the newspaper for coming out week. And my parents and I were on the cover. It was like, it was huge, you know? And I, I have it framed in, in my house because there they are just beaming. And, you know, that's a long way from uh, May of 1986. So, this is in May of 1986. Uh, you meet your partner, Mark, in 1987. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you then are become the canon to the ordinary in 1988. Which so let me say something about that. Yeah. So um, there was only one thing I knew for sure when I came out. It's that I would uh, never be able to act as an ordained person again. I, I was absolutely sure of that. And it is so easy to forget I mean, that's not all that long ago, right? It's 30 years ago. Um, and, and this new bishop, um, we, my wife and I went to see him because you go to the bishop to tell him you're getting divorced and why and so on and so forth. I told him why. And, um, so about two months later, I go back to him. He's, he's brand new. And I, I walk in. I, this is so ridiculous. I walk in and I say to him, you have a fantastic vision for this diocese, and I think I'm just the guy to help you get there. <laughs> I mean, really, I would have thrown me out if, if that had been me. Um, and I left with a job. So that, that's 1987 or 8, and he, um, uh, at that time, I was the only openly gay person on any bishop's staff in America, right? I mean, that's, that's how far we've come in 30 years. Um, and I, I thought my ordained life was over. I mean, I knew I could, I could worship, but uh, I, I was pretty sure that my, my ordained life was over. And I, and I owe my life to that man. And I was his assistant for 18 years. I would have followed him off a cliff. Um, um, those of you who know New Hampshire at all know that the Manchester Union leader is this yellow journalism, awful, awful paper. And um, uh, he just took them on about this issue. Uh, he, had no, he had no fear. He was also the straightest man I have ever known in my life. There was not a gay cell in his body. And he would often, he would often say to me, Come in here, come, come in here. I need to ask you a question about your people, you would call them. <laughs> so we started uh, talking about my people and his, and his people, right? Uh, a and I don't even know where he learned to be this open. He, he didn't particularly know any gay people, but he knew, he knew justice and he read his Bible, right? And uh, he had read the prophets. 
and he knew that he should be standing up for anyone who was suffering any kind of injustice. And so this one happened to be um, on the front burner uh, for the next two or three decades. And um, so he preached the sermon at my consecration um, as a bishop. So 17 years, you are the canon to the ordinary, and the bishop is, is your boss. Mm -hmm. And to walk us through his, uh, then at some point in, 19, in 2003, you start an ascension towards being coming a bishop. Talk us through that. So to give you the, the complete story, so um, I began to feel God um, nipping at my heels a little bit like a yappy dog. I mean, it's like you just can't get rid of them and just like go away and leave me alone. Um, and I felt this calling. So, so we have the, the um, calling to ordination, the calling to come out, and then this, this. Um, I mean, it just made no sense. I mean, I had these fights with God, um, like. You know what's going to happen, right? If if I do this, I mean, w we know each other. Uh, let's talk here. Uh, this is going to be awful, and um, I don't want to do that. Uh, but um, uh, I decided that I would uh, let my name go in. Um, and after the first time, I, I realized that what God may have had in mind for me was just to affect the lives of the people on the search committee of that diocese. And that would have been a, a wonderful thing. And I was actually in six of those processes before I was ever finally nominated. You, you know, they keep narrowing down and then they put forward. And in five of those six, I was told by the committee that I should have been a nominee, but they were terrified of the hailstorm that would come down on them if they nominated an openly gay person. And then, you'll love this, and then Jack Spong decided to retire. And of course, he's totally fearless. His diocese is totally fearless. And I was nominated, 1998. Um, and a very sort of interesting dynamic happened. I was not elected. And then in the next year, I was nominated in the Diocese of Rochester, New York. And um, that was kind of a heartbreaker because um, Mark and I fell in love with those people. I, we just loved it. And um, um, everybody ultimately in the course of the election, everybody withdrew except for two of us, the, the guy who won and me and the the margin in the vote, there were about 300 people, 400 people voting. The margin was, I lost by one clergy vote and two lay votes. That's how close it was. So that was a heartbreaker, that was 1998. And then there were lots of bishop elections in places, including Vermont, that I just didn't feel called to. I didn't feel like I was the right person for that diocese. And so I wasn't, and nothing happened for, five years. And then my own bishop uh, retired, uh, was getting ready to retire. And uh, it's a very unusual thing to be elected uh, in the diocese in which you're serving, because <laughs> they know you too well, right? <laughs> uh, you know, some, some new bright and shiny object uh, from some other place that you only see for a few hours uh, can uh, kind of pull the wool over your eyes, but if you've been around for, and, and I was, you know, in all of those congregations for 18 years. So it was a, a, a special um, honor for me to be elected by my people. Um, and it turned out to be the right thing because indeed the hailstorm did come down and the people we sort of never thought about this. The people who were best able to make the case for why I should be their bishop were those people who had known me for 28 years, right? Nobody else. I mean, if I had been elected in the Diocese of Newark, people would have said, oh, those crazy liberal 
uh, Episcopalians under Jack Spong. Of course they did this, you know. They were just trying to, you know, poke us in the eye. But New Hampshire? I mean, it's not, ex you know, it's just like this wonderful little backwater diocese, you know. Um, and, and so they could make the case uh, better than anyone else, and, and, and they did. So, um, so on Friday, I'm nobody. I'm, I mean, I'm Gene, but I'm, you know, I'm nobody. On Saturday, I'm elected. Um, the only person who, who saw this coming was the religion editor of the New York Times. Laurie Goodstein was at my election. She got the first interview, and from that day on, she always got the first interview. Um, so I'm elected. The next morning, m my picture is on the front page of every newspaper around the world. And the next morning, I'm sitting with Matt Lauer on the Today Show. <laughs> now, there's no ramp up time. You know, I didn't get, like, get a little bit famous and then a little bit more famous. I'm just like, boom, there it was. And all of a sudden, I was on this uh, wild uh, roller coaster. Um, so the election happened, it happened so fast. It normally takes a number of ballots. It happened so fast, people took their box lunches and went home. I mean, it didn't even go past lunch. Um, and uh, I started getting death threats before I even got home. Um, and, and this wonderful thing happened. So I call, the, I, we live in this little town, Ware, New Hampshire, and it's like, I don't know, maybe a thousand people. And, uh, and it's not a town, it's just that's how many of us were out in the boonies. And um, so I call the, the police uh, uh, department, which was, I think, all of three people maybe, uh, and let them know about the death threats. And I said, uh, you know, <laughs> I've not done this before, so I, don't, I just thought I should let you know. So we talked, and they said, we'll keep an eye on the house, and so on. And we're about to hang up, and this, this policeman, who I don't know from Adam, really, says to me, uh, I think he even called me Bishop Robinson. Bishop Robinson, we just want you to know how proud we are of you. I almost cried now thinking of it because it's like uh, this uh, completely unexpected support from people that stereotypically I would have expected to have been critical, right? Do you know that those police, until I moved away from there in 2013, those police drove into our driveway twice a night, seven nights a week, 365 days a year, and shone the lights all around. I got up to pee one night and I thought, what is going on in my driveway? <laughs> right? And, and then I started looking for it and twice a night, every night, they came. Just to let whomever know um, that that somebody was, you know, watching out for us. So, um, and then the way this works in the Episcopal Church, a, a diocese can choose their bishop, but then the rest of the church has to consent to that election. So, it was, we had only cleared the first hump. So two months later, there's their general convention and uh, everybody has to vote. You have to get a majority of the bishops, a majority of the clergy, and a majority of the laity in order to get, um, uh, to, then, to then become a bishop. Um, um, normally we would have somewhere between 12 and 20 uh, press people, you know, people with press credentials, um, journalists and, and photographers and so on. We had 432 <laughs> registered uh, press and media there. Um, I'm sitting on the floor of the convention and there are people with zoom lenses, you know, this long, pointed at me. Uh, anyway, so uh, ultimately uh, the vote goes yes uh, for the laity and the clergy, but very dramatically, here's what happens. I'm sitting there because I'm, I'm a delegate from my diocese to the, to the convention. So. Um, they had set aside, it was either an hour or two hours for the debate, and it would go from microphone to microphone. Those in favor, those opposed. Those in favor, those opposed. So we knew not many people would get to talk, 
And so we had those people poised to get right to the, right to the microphone to speak for it. And, uh, and, they, and they did, and they were lined up. And there were more than were going to get to talk. You know, there were 30 people, like, lined up. So we're sitting there, we're listening to the debate, I'm being called every kind of name in the, in the book, and you know, so on and so forth. And we sort of become aware of a lot of people moving. Well, I mean, it just seemed like there was a lot of activity when we were supposed to be just sitting there listening. So we looked around and people were going to stand in the pro line to speak. Now there was no prayer of them ever getting to speak, but the line went from 30 to 50 to 90 to 200 until the line went all the way around uh, a convention center that was like the size of two football fields, right? I mean, there were probably 500 people in line. It was just astounding. Nobody planned that. It just happened. And um, so I got two-thirds of the clergy and two-thirds of the laity. The next day was to go to the bishops for a similar process. And uh, uh, I have so many death threats at this point. I have 24-hour security. Uh, you know, nobody knows where I'm staying. I get taken in the back door, you know, like a rock star or something. Uh, you know, in the back door, and I'm, I emerge uh, onto the floor of the convention without ever, like, uh, being uh, near enough, for hopefully, for somebody to shoot me. So um, uh, I walk out of the hotel with my two bodyguards, and I'm going up to the uh, Caribou Cafe. Do you have those around here? It's, a, it's like Pete's Coffee or uh, Starbucks or whatever. And uh, there was a lady selling coffee in the, in the Caribou Cafe. She was just one of the baristas. And uh, when people would show up and they ha would have an Episcopal Church Convention badge on, she would ask them, were they voting for yes for me or no for me? And if they said yes, she gave them their coffee. <laughs> I swear. And so I, um, I, I was going up to thank her. I thought that was just a lovely thing. I'm on my way back with my two bodyguards, and the chancellor, the presiding bishop's chancellor, like her lawyer, sa says, no, his lawyer, it was, um, our presiding bishop was Frank Griswold at the time, um, you are in big trouble. Follow me. I'm like, what? what? Yeah, exactly. What did I do? So I follow him. I, uh, I, I go into, uh, I'm taken into the lobby of the hotel. And before anything else can happen, the chancellor, that is the lawyer for the Diocese of Minnesota, who's a dear friend and a lesbian, said, uh, uh, intercepts us. And she says, you need a lawyer. And she looks. <laughs> she looks around, and Paul Cooney from the Diocese of Washington, D.C., walks in. She said, Paul, you need to be his lawyer. <laughs> I still don't know what, what's going on. Well, so make a long story short. So there had been two um, complaints of sexual misconduct against me. One was for sexual harassment, and one was for um, being linked to a pornographic website. So... Um, uh, we have a, an elaborate procedure when any of those kinds of allegations are made. We were one of the denominations that really sort of forged this whole process. Um, and I, I helped set the national standards, so I, I, I knew what needed to happen, which is that it needed to be investigated and so on and so forth. Well, so over the next 36 hours, they did this investigation. Well, so it turned out that the, the fellow who, um, when they interviewed the fellow, actually turned out to be from Vermont, who used to attend a, an annual conference that I would run for the seven dioceses of New England. And, um, and when they asked him what, uh, about the sexual harassment, he said that I had put my hand on his arm. And, and, it, and then they said, and, and then what? Oh, no, that's, that's all he did. Did he invite you back to his room? Oh, no, 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 Like, was, were, you, were you two alone? Oh, no, there were about 200 people in the room. <laughs> anyway, it just, it just sort of began to 
unravel. I, I mean, I don't, I don't doubt that the man was uncomfortable, but um, it clearly didn't meet the, the definition of that. And then um, it turns out that the pornographic website thing had all been made up, that um, I had been associated with a, a support group for uh, uh, kids, 12 to 20-year-old uh, LGBT kids in Concord. And uh, two years after I left helping run that group, uh, there was a, a, a link on their website to a link to a link to a pornographic website, right? Like four clicks away. And somebody quickly showed that with three clicks you could get from the Episcopal Church the National Church's website to a pornographic website, right? If you just clicked on the right series of clicks. So it all went away. The debate happened with the, with the bishops, and I got two-thirds of the bishops. Um, and so when I was shown, a, a, given a courtesy seat on the floor of the House of Bishops, uh, as is customary when you're introduced, everyone stands and applauds and so on. So about, mm, Half of them, maybe, maybe a little more, uh, stood and applauded. At the first break, this is so telling, the first break, I'm sitting in my chair, and another bishop, the Bishop of Northern Indiana, very conservative, right? But a really good guy. Very conservative. Came over uh, on his knees beside my chair, and he said, Gene, I want to apologize. I said, goodness, Ed, what, what, what for? He said, well, when, when you were introduced, I neither stood nor applauded. And, and I almost immediately thought, what an awful way to begin a relationship. So I wanted to ask your forgiveness for that and see if we could start over. I love that guy. And I continued to love him throughout uh, my, my episcopate. And um, when it came to 2008, when I was excluded from the worldwide um, meeting of, of uh, Anglican bishops um, that happens every 10 years, uh, he was one of the people I asked to try to negotiate with the Archbishop of Canterbury to, to see if I could um, be allowed to come. So, I mean, he, he just became a dear friend um, and stayed, stayed um, uh, conservative when, when the Episcopal Church allowed marriages of uh, two people of the same gender, um, he said, I, I can't do it. But he called the bishops of every diocese that surrounded his to see if his clergy could take his gay couples over to their diocese and marry them and then come home. You know, it wasn't a perfect answer, but it was, it was a good answer, right? And it worked for him, and he preserved his own integrity, and those people got married, and thanks be to God, right? Tommy, you had a consecration service in uh, September of that year. What was that ceremony like? Because it didn't stop necessarily the discussion. No, no. So it was, it was actually in November. Okay. It was um, All Saints weekend. And um, interestingly, a Jew paid for $100,000 worth of security for me that weekend. He was the um, creator and executive producer of Will and Grace, whom I had met and become friends with. And he heard about, um, you know, all the death threats and so on and so forth, you know. So he paid for bomb sniffing dogs and m mounted police and sharpshooters on the roof and mm -hmm. we did two days of sweeping the bill so there was no uh, we expected a lot of people uh, and there was no place in new hampshire that would hold four thousand people except for the hockey rink mm -hmm. at the university of new hampshire that's where my consecration was mm -hmm. so we put some big oriental rugs on the uh, well not on the ice you know they covered the ice but there on the on the ice and, um, and seated all the bishops and all that right here. And then it was fantastic. There's, there's a completely unobstructed view. I mean, there's no bad seat in the house, right? <laughs> just, just all the way around. So, um, so we had about 4,000 people. Uh, we had maybe 50 people from that, the crazy church in Kansas. Um, Fred Phelps's church, you know, the God Hates Fags 
church had had foul, uh, awful signs and uh, drawings, and ugh, it was awful. Uh, unbeknownst to us, uh, I mean, th there had been some uh, uh, news reports that they were coming to protest. Three hundred young people from the University of New Hampshire showed up with matching T-shirts that said uh, "Gay?" Question mark. Fine by me. <laughs> Three hundred of them to shout down and stand between those protesters and the people coming to the consecration. And um, they stayed there for the three and a half hours of the consecration in the pouring rain to make sure that people when they left were not accosted by these people. I mean, little things like that. The Quakers of New Hampshire, many of whom were trained to be like monitors in protest marches and stuff, uh, said that as their gift to me as the new Bishop of New Hampshire, they would like to be present to act as a, as a, um, uh, a reconciling f force there so that if, if there were confrontations that uh, there would be somebody to sort of help with that. Um, it's lovely, lovely things. And then, um, so, by the way, this I, is I a had an email come in today from somebody who said, uh, please ask the bishop if uh, uh, there was in fact actual security to protect him, yes, and that you had a bulletproof vest, yeah. and that uh, a couple of people there were dressed up as visiting bishops were in fact security. So here's the scoop. <laughs> My people are on this here. I guess so. So most of that's right. Um, so the, the important thing to say here is that um, during this period in, in my life, um, and you know, the, the, the death threats continued for about two and a half years, um, pretty much daily, uh, sometimes multiple um, on, on a given day. And God has never seemed more close than God seemed at that point. I mean, God seemed so close that praying felt redundant. I mean, sort of like, like when you're with someone that closely, it just, it just felt odd. And I was, and you, you cannot imagine how chaotic and, and crazy it was. Um, and we, you know, we had all the, like at the airport, all the screening stuff for, uh, uh, x-rays and uh, you know all that stuff. I was so calm in the middle of all that I took an hour's nap just before the consecration mm -hmm. which I look back on that and I just think that that's unbelievable. So I get up from the nap I put on my uh, bulletproof vest and of course my daughters are freaking out and it gave me the opportunity to say to them you know, like one of the rewards uh, that I've experienced of being a Christian is I've learned that there are far worse things than death. Like not living your life. That's worse than death. Or it is death, really, in a, in a kind of way. And I said, if something happens out there today, you will know that I was doing something that I felt rightly or wrongly, I felt called by God to do and that I was honored to do. And it kind of doesn't get any better than that. So I don't want to die, I, don't want, I just want to be a bishop, I don't want to be a martyr, right? <laughs> and, uh, but if that were to happen, in an odd sort of way, it, it, it's okay, you know. So, so we go out. So the guy standing, not any of the bishops, but the, like the, Deacon standing next to me was like an armed tank. He had, I don't think he had a bazooka under there, but he had just about everything else. <laughs> and he loved getting in the vestments because he had been an acolyte as a, <laughs> as a boy. And he hadn't been in church vestments for years, right? So, uh, so we had a plan. Uh, it takes, uh, the way you become a bishop is, three bishops in the apostolic succession all the way back to Jesus, right? Lays hands on you, 
and you become a bishop. So um, we, we had this plan that if uh, shots were fired or a bomb went off, this guy was to get on top of me and if I was still alive, uh, uh, get me out. And we had a, um, a room designated where he would take me. We had three bishops who would lay hands on me uh, designated to get to that room and a photographer so we could prove that three bishops had laid hands on my head. Uh, they had typed my blood uh, already so they could start triage on the way to the hospital. Um, you know, it was, uh, um, and nothing happened. <laughs> and I became a bishop, just like that. Um, uh, it was, it was an amazing thing, and um, uh, Frank Griswold, our presiding bishop, was not always known to be the most uh, courageous person, shall we say? But that day, he rose to the test. He could have had someone else do it um, for him. And he did not, uh, you know, dodge that bullet. He, he, uh, he presided. Um, and then, and then took unmitigated grief from his uh, counterparts, the archbishops uh, and primates from around the world of the, of the Anglican Communion. So, um, uh, so yeah, so I, 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 got, or, I got ordained. <laughs> and, um, uh, and it was a beautiful service. I had, you know, um, um, every choir, every church choir in the diocese was represented by singers. And the music was uh, just magnificent. And of course, it was All Saints, uh, right? So you have all those great All Saints hymns. Um, so it was, yeah, it was really pretty, pretty amazing. So that's the real high of that moment. And then the, the discussion continues. It, that wasn't yeah. the end. No, um, so at that point, though, what was interesting about it is, um, that's when the entire Episcopal Church got put on the hot seat, like uh, on, a, on a world stage. For, that was one of the things that happened. Um, the, the press would, uh, and, the, and uh, TV and all that, one of the things they would always say to me on air, you know, um, was, so how does it feel to be the guy that, you know, split the church? <laughs> That's like, you know, like, when did you stop beating your wife, right? It's like, there's not a great answer to that. And, and what, I would, what I would say was, look, I'd, so here's, here's the part I played. I felt called by God to do this, and I said yes. That's all I'm responsible for. Now, my diocese is responsible for having nominated me and then elected me. So, ask them. But then, you know, they, they elected me and then the general convention voted. So ask them, right? So like, I'm, res I, I'm responsible for this one piece. I'm just trying to be faithful to the God that I know in my own life. And I think each person along the way, that's, that's what they were trying to do. And, and at the end of the day, I became a bishop, right? So, um, so we had all this confrontation going on internationally with the Episcopal Church. Um, you know, were we going to be sanctioned and kept out of the councils and blah, blah, blah. And then uh, within our own church, we had um, um, actually a, 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 a movement to lead people out of the Episcopal Church, which was actually centered right in Pittsburgh, right? The Bishop of Pittsburgh, whom I was in seminary with. I was in seminary with him for three years. One of us wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I don't know which one of us, but we had the same professors and everything. So we come out on these two sides of this thing. Um, and uh, about 100,000 people left out of two million. Now, 100,000 is a lot of people, but if you had just read the headlines, Right in the newspapers, you would have thought this was a big 50-50 split in the Episcopal Church. And, and that, in fact, we had had a schism. We didn't have a schism. We had a bunch of people who left, right? But the Diocese of Pittsburgh continues. The Diocese of San Joaquin, whose bishop left, continues. And, and so there were four bishops that left. 
Um, but you can't take your diocese with them. The diocese is a creation of the Episcopal Church. And of course, what they wanted were the buildings and the assets. Except that, you know, 100 years ago when somebody left their, you know, left money in their will to St. Swithin's by the gas pump, they meant for it to be used by St. Swithin's, not by some breakaway group, right? So that all had to be fought out in courts and everything. Um, so uh, it was not uh, strife free, and I, I never took it lightly. Uh, I, I did not relish the fact that, that it was, you know, hard for a lot of people. What I did in my own diocese, I mean, we're, uh, you know, it wasn't a unanimous vote for me to be their bishop, and, there, and we had plenty of conservative people, obviously, in New Hampshire. But what, <laughs> what I said to them was, look, so I'm on a, your church is on a rota, uh, and I, you know, I visit a different church every Sunday, and it takes me about a year and a half to get around to everybody, and then I start over. I said, like, on the Sunday I'm supposed to come to your parish, go somewhere else. I go to the Methodist church, you know, <laughs> or, or go to, a, a, you know, an Episcopal church somewhere else. But like, just because there's a little gay guy in Concord, New Hampshire, that's your bishop, doesn't mean you need to give up the church that, you know, you were married in, your kids were baptized in, your parents were buried from. Like, don't, I mean, you know, we can get, we can get through this. And, um, and so um, we pretty much didn't have any of the, the um, people that, uh, joined the breakaway thing. We had a couple that tried, uh, um, and it just didn't work because, um, you know, the church didn't change all that much, um, as far as anybody could tell. And, um, and, and you could certainly say that to somebody, you know, in Arizona, like, really? Because there's a little gay guy in, in Concord, New Hampshire? You're going to give all that up? So um, many, many, many of those people have come back uh, because indeed, uh, and, and, the world has changed. I mean, some of those people are like, in, in 2018, they're saying, we did what? Over, over that? Right? Because the world has changed. But only that few years ago, uh, what, 14 years ago, um, the world was really different. And the church was really different. Here's the interesting thing. If you, if you happen to be Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, um, at least those, I think there's, I'm missing somebody. They were waiting to see if this was going to kill us. Everybody was like hanging back a bit because it looked there for a time like we were just going to like come unglued. And so people were like, uh, we'll just watch and see. And then when it became clearer that, uh, you know, we lost some people, but you know, we weren't, we weren't coming apart. Um, and, and you know what? There were a lot of people who stayed who didn't like it, right? But they didn't think it was the most important thing in the world. And, um, and I always appreciated them because they, um, it, it was not easy for them. They did not understand why the church had changed its rules. Like, and I would always say, look, these people are only believing what we taught them, right? We taught them that gay people were an abomination. So it's a little hard to blame them for believing what we taught them, right? And we have to be a little bit generous and a little bit gracious about the fact that we've changed our minds about that, about what scripture meant by that. Um, I mean, nobody rung a bell and said, you know, okay, God has changed God's mind. Um, so so I, I appreciated those people who, who said, I don't like this, but I'm, I'm not going to leave my church over it. And at the end of the day, you know, the, the world sort of caught up and, and then it was okay. Um, interestingly, I thought there would be another gay uh, person uh, elected bishop sooner than it happened. So I was elected in 2003. The next, the next um, gay bishop, uh, and we've only had one more, openly gay. I mean, hello, we've always had gay bishops, right? Let's just, <laughs> let's just be clear about that in lots of denominations. Um, uh, was uh, Mary Glasspool was elected uh, the 
uh, assistant or suffragan bishop in uh, Los Angeles, but not until 2010. And uh, so now here's the difference. 2003, I'm elected bishop. My picture's on the front page of every newspaper around the world. In 2012, the Lutheran Church elects its first openly gay and partnered bishop, right? Uh, he's also in Los Angeles, so Mary and I go to his consecration, lay hands on him. It didn't even make the LA Times. <laughs> really. That's nine years. That's, what, that's how the world had changed. It was, it was like, oh, 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 the church elected another gay bishop. So um, it, was, um, it was just kind of breathtaking to see that kind of change over that amount of time. Everybody's waiting for me to tie in Robert Jackson. <laughs> do you do that in every interview? I to think of how can Peterson pull this off? <laughs> so here's how, let's try, I'm going to try this, here we go. Your bodyguard at your consecration was an acolyte. Yeah. And my <laughs> cousin through marriage was Dennis O'Prey. Get out! Yeah, Dennis O'Prey. And Dennis O'Prey, who you know through yeah, your world. Forever. Yeah, and we'll ask you to tell a story because he's going to watch this. Uh, <laughs> Dennis O'Prey was the acolyte for the funeral service of Justice Robert H. Jackson at the same <laughs> age as Mr. McCain. The man is a pro. Okay. Now, talk, I, this is this is now on tape. Do you have a Dennis O'Prey story? You know, I don't. Um, uh, I uh, Dennis and I were separated by such distance we didn't get to see each other very much. I think he was in L.A., wasn't he? Right. Yeah. And was he at All Saints, uh, Pasadena? Yeah. Pasadena, correct. Yeah, yeah I think so. Uh, but I don't. Uh, I I sort of got really close to All Saints, Pasadena, uh, after I was elected bishop. They sort of became my. Um, home away from home, and this was a, a, a moving thing for me. So from, from the day I was elected, they prayed for me by name, out loud, in church, every Sunday. Good. And, um, you know, so, so I was getting this kind of like support from so many places and um, um, holding me up in prayer and, and so on, yeah. But, um, but I always admired Dennis, and I think he was on the National Council of the Episcopal Church, the uh, Executive Council it's called. Uh, it's sort of like the vestry for the National Church. Um, great, great priest, um, respected by everybody. Yeah, and uh, his paths crossed, and it was on that same committee with uh, Desmond Tutu, who wrote the introduction to this book, which I highly recommend. <laughs> So I had, uh, um, on the cover, uh, and, and the forward, it was Desmond Tutu in this book, and in my second book, uh, uh, Barack Obama, we have on the cover. So you can't get much better than in my book, but with Barack Obama and, and uh, Desmond Tutu. You conclude this book with a, with a, with a uh, statement, and I don't want you to comment on it. You read it all the way through to the end? Look, at see this? I see. I worked it up. Uh, you concluded, it's not necessary for us to live to see the finished product of reconciliation. It's enough for us to be a part of the march. Talk to me about that. Yeah. Put that in. So, um, uh, so all, everything I know about our efforts for gay and lesbian, bisexual and transgender people to be welcomed into not just the society but into churches and synagogues and mosques and so on. Almost everything about that movement and how I understood it, uh, I learned from uh, the African American effort um, in the civil rights movements of the 60s and, and beyond. Um, uh, you know, uh, I am not saying they're the same. I'm saying that oppression tends to, to have the same dynamics no matter who the, who the target is, right? And so they operate similarly. Um, I mean, w we've never known what it's like to be enslaved 
as human beings and uh, you know it's that's just unspeakable so i'm not saying it's the same but i've learned so much from that so when i went to memphis um i went to what what i consider to be one of my favorite places in america which is the national civil rights museum and it's at the old lorraine hotel where um dr king was assassinated it's in the warehouse district because he couldn't stay anywhere else. He, he, he couldn't get a room anywhere else except for this, this kind of isolated uh, uh, motel. And as you go in the front door, so they preserved the entire Lorraine Motel. I mean, uh, you, you think you don't have an image of it in your mind, but when you see it, it it'll come right back to you. Um, and then they built a, a one-story, one, one level uh, museum in all behind it so that when you drive up you don't see anything but the motel right yeah. it's very powerful uh, as you go in the front door there is a, a, a black monolith I don't know if it's onyx or I don't know what kind of stone it is but it's it's big and it has an uh, ever upwardly spiraling um, trail of African Americans and everybody is holding somebody's hand or standing on somebody's shoulders. And what I, what I learned that day and what I've learned from that movement is that there were people who, who lived and worked and marched and died in that struggle who would never live to see any measure of freedom, never mind total freedom and equality. We still don't have it, right? So the people who are working on that right now will not live to see it either. But it was enough to be in that trail of that, in that community of people and standing on the shoulders of people who were even more removed from the rewards of it, but it was enough to be a part of that march forward. And, um, you know, and, and for a long time I thought, I thought the role that I would play in that march in my movement would just be uh, in the contact with these uh, search committees. And if I changed some lives in that way, or if one of them had a gay son and you know, it affected how they uh, accepted him or whatever, then that, you know, I would have been happy with that. I still to this day don't know why th this other thing fell to me. I, I, I just kind of have given up trying to figure it out. But well, and, and, and you have to know, so I got really sick of being called the gay bishop. Every headline. It took like nine years before the first headline about me did not have gay in it, right? Never mind, I'm running a diocese, right? I'm not only doing all this other stuff, I'm actually running a diocese. I've got 48 congregations, nine summer chapels, and three schools I'm taking care of, right? And, and it just irritated the bejesus out of me that, you know, I wasn't just Bishop Robinson, I was always the gay bishop. So, um, and then about two years in, I realized that that was incredibly selfish of me, that how dare I turn my back on the opportunity that God had given me to, to help lives of people I would never even meet, right? Like, they didn't, have, they didn't have Barack Obama calling them to pray at the Lincoln Memorial. You know, I sat tw tw 20 feet from, from Barack Obama on the presidential platform at his swearing in. I got to walk out of the Capitol onto the platform with two million people on the mall. And I, <laughs> I got to see Colin Powell, who was in the row in front of me, down at the end, who sat behind Aretha Franklin, who wore that hat. <laughs> Do you remember her hat? Enormous hat. He spent the entire time doing this <laughs> and then doing that and then doing this, and ultimately he took out his cell phone and watched the inauguration on his cell phone. <laughs> okay, so, so um, you know, how, how selfish it would have been 
of me to have turned my back on that opportunity, right? And so what I decided was, I was gonna try to be the best gay bishop there ever was, <laughs> right? And I was, gonna, I was gonna say yes to every opportunity that I thought could move us all forward. And, um, and so I kind of like made my peace with that. And then I just stopped bristling at the gay bishop and I'm like, if that's what it takes for me to be here talking to you, so be it. Um, I don't even know where I started on that. What was the question again? <laughs> All right, this may be the second to the last, the penalty. Oh yeah, just to be a part of that, part of that uh, spiral, yeah, right? Yeah. Holding hands, standing on shoulders, that's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. This is, the, again, my cousin Dennis asked, he's, he wrote three pages. Did he really? Yeah. Where is he living now? He's Minneapolis. Oh, yeah. that's right, he was from Minnesota, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Minnesota. Yep. <laughs> so here's what he says, tell, this is to you, Tell him his old friend Opre remains unwilling to cede the religious dialogue in this country to non-denominational, mostly fundamentalist voices, but he worries that mainliners are losing the battle. Can Chautauqua play a part in the restoration of solid theology, common sense, universal values, and religious freedom? And you don't have to answer that if you don't want oh, to. Oh, I want to. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so here's the thing. Um, um, I got a lot of criticism for, you know, doing interviews or, you know, the, uh, Ed Bradley coming to my house to interview me for 60 minutes and all that kind of stuff. Like, you're just a, you're just a, um, a, a media whore. Well, you know what? Jesus went where the people were. Right? He didn't stay in Nazareth or any other little place. I mean, you know, he went where the people were. And do you know where the people are now? They're in the media, they're on Twitter, they're, you know, all of those things. And we cannot s sit here and not be engaged in that way and think we're gonna change very many people. There is no question in my mind that Chautauqua is a life-changing experience for the people who wind up here. But but uh, we are a rare bunch that, that get to be here. And so, so for instance, yes, I, I think we can play a role. And I think uh, Emily is going to help us. Um, Emily Morris is her last name. Um, Emily is, is going to have us out there, whether we want to be out there or not. So we better get out there with something good, right? Um, so, so what I think Michael Hill's vision is, is that this place uh, does become a kind of lighthouse and that the, our light isn't kept under a bushel, but is it, uh, in fact, it, it gets shown uh, further and further uh, to more and more people, so indeed that we can have that kind of, uh, of an effect. And I think, I, um, I think we've been run ragged by the, uh, the crazy, not, not just conservative people, but, but the crazy religious right. I mean, you know, uh, I don't know what you think about uh, Donald Trump, but, but the fact that 81% of evangelicals voted for him, 81%, and gave up, I think, a lot of what we thought were their moral values to do so. And, and, um, it's time we showed up, you know? And, and we can't just show up at the 1045 and the two o'clock lectures. We've got to show up beyond these walls. And, and uh, every way that we can do that uh, will be a step in the right direction. And of course, the personal uh, stories and talking and so on is, is really important. But in this day and age, if, if, if you're not in the media, if you're not using social media and so on and so forth, you're not where the people are. And uh, it seemed, seems clear to me that one of the brilliant things about Jesus is that he, he, he went where the people were. And he went especially uh, to the people that he knew needed what he had to say the most, right? Um, uh, notorious sinners, people on the margins, the vulnerable, the poor, uh, the sick, 
um, and uh, and that's where we need to that's where we need to be. We're going to end as we began. Maureen Ravenio talked about you and introduced you. Can you talk a little bit about Maureen Ravenio? Oh, I can't <laughs> wait. This is, this is like, this is your life, Maureen Ravenio. Um, so, um, so I will, uh, what I will tell you is what you already know which is that she is the power behind uh, a lot of my predecessors, right? Um, uh, the religion department is what it is because of her. That doesn't mean that Joan and Robert and others haven't done, and, or that I will not do my part, but she is the, 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 the spine and soul of the religion department. And, um, and together, uh, we are going to um, uh, change some things. So let me tell let me tell you something that I've discovered. I mean, this is kind of uh, news to me. I hope I'm not telling uh, stories out of school, but I mean, this this just happened today. So uh, religion doesn't count for much around here. You may not know that, or it doesn't count for as much as I think it counts in the minds of, of the people who come here. And here's what I mean by that. Um, there is some fantastic research being done on you and everybody else who comes here uh, by virtue of scanning you in every time you go to the AMP, right? And other things. You don't get scanned in the Hall of Philosophy. Now, we want to keep it um, um, uh, pastoral and informal and you know is the way we spread out on the lawn and everything we don't want to we don't want to interrupt that but if if you don't count something you can't manage it you can't advocate for it you can't you, you can't move it forward because you don't have any you don't have any data to go on so I've been bitching about that ever since I arrived <laughs> like why don't we get scanned what are we chopped liver it's like and then today, a document got passed out, a very helpful document, that um, listed the themes, the weekly themes, for the, like, like the last 25 years. I picked it up and I looked at it and I said to the group, I said, these aren't the, these aren't the themes for the last 25 years. These are the themes of the 1045 lecture platform for the last 25 years. Where are the, where are the religion themes? For every one of these, there's a religion theme. Either, it's either a religious take on that theme or it's a standalone uh, different theme. I'm like, hello, we're here. Maureen and I are ready. So, um, uh, so one of the things that I, I think is, and, and mercifully, I feel like Michael Hill has this in his heart, right? Is to make religion count here and to do whatever it takes for us to, to be as um, up on things as the rest of, of the institution is, uh, because it's, it's, it, it's just quite wonderful. Um, and and w the odd thing is, I don't think anybody is opposed to that. It's just like nobody thinks of it. Well, I'm going to be a pain in the butt about that until, until we achieve some sort of parity um, about this, because be going back to Dennis's um, thing, we have we have a mission here. Religion has been at the center of this place from day one, right? And it's going to be my unspeakable honor to live in the cottage that Lewis Miller lived in, and that family is is so excited that a clergy person is going to be living there and bring that back to that place, right? And um, so I, I, like Dennis, I believe Chautauqua can play that role, but it's not going to happen uh, if, if we're all just passively watching. And so Maureen and I, I, I can't tell you how, how much fun we're having and how exciting it is. And, um, and, and may I just mention, she knows everybody in the world. <laughs> There is nobody that she doesn't know. Um, so um, I think we're, gonna, we're bringing you um, uh, nine great preachers 
new, some new faces, some new blood um, from nine different denominations. We've been very careful. Three on the evangelical side, three in the middle, three on the progressive side. I checked them off as I did them, you know. Uh, so to, to have a partner like this uh, in this work, first of all, I wouldn't have said yes to this job if, it hadn't, if Maureen hadn't been here. And um, uh, it just makes it such a joy. And um, I, I couldn't be uh, more thankful. Thank you. So mutual. While we're giving applause, ladies and gentlemen, Bishop Gene Robinson. Thank you very much. <laughs>